Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another virtual science happy hour. In fact, this is our eighth installment, which means that it is our two month anniversary. What? Yeah, we've been doing this once a week uh, for the last two months. Um, I need to get out of the house more. It's supposed to be that long. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's still going, um, but we are actually, this is going to be the last um, weekly one broadcast from our living room. We are going to um, move on to some bigger, better things, which I will share with everyone at the end. Um, so we'll tell you all about that, that later. Um, so this week, though, we have, uh, we're getting some national exposure, and we have Rob Soto um, all the way in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So that's pretty cool. Um, hey guys. In the live streams, is we can get anyone from anywhere. Um, and as I mentioned last week, actually, um, I spent some time living in New Mexico uh, for a bird research job. And so, from one New Mexican to another, the first question I have to ask is: red or green? Uh, well, as you can tell by my shirt, it's always green, man. Uh, <laughs> that Christmas stuff is a cop out. Don't pick one. It's, it's it's green or it's you know if you're having uh, beef then I think maybe red is appropriate but apart from that I don't know like green is classic can't go wrong with that good answer okay we can keep going there right yeah. okay. we're, not, we're not afraid of controversies here at Steampunk Academy uh, oh, well in that case uh, <laughs> as long as it's not from Colorado <laughs> we, we I guess you know speech and everything I suppose. Um, <laughs> Um, so what we have this week is, is uh, we actually have the people that are going to be interviewed. Up here. Um, it's going to be Brenda and Don. They are uh, board members of Steampunk Academy and, I guess, to data scientists, I guess I could call you all. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, right? that, would be, that, would, that would count. Um, and so let's just hand it over to you. And first, um, we have to tell, us, tell everyone what we're drinking. Uh, so me and Sky here, we are drinking Quitos. Um, they're they're uh, Pink Boots collaboration. And so what this is, is uh, the Pink Boots Society is a group of, uh, of uh, female identified brewers here in Salt Lake City. And yeah. this project was all the, the women of, of Quitos working together on a brew called Red is the New Pink. It's a hoppy red ale. I'm digging it. It's, yes. nice. it's a light. I love reds. Five percent. Um, yeah. So, so I'm digging it. And sorry, Rob, we couldn't get you any beer. Um, <laughs> it's been a long drive, and yeah. So we should mention that Kitos is our sponsor this week. Yes, they are our sponsor. Way to go. So, so be sure to drink Kitos beer yeah. <laughs> if you can get it. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are you all? What are you drinking, Rob? I am drinking an old-fashioned, since we're going to be talking about some old-fashioned uh, life forms today. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, oh, that, tastes like prohibition. Uh, <laughs> um, let's pass it over to Brendan and Don. What are you all drinking? And then we're just going to let you take it from here. So I am drinking Keto's Northeast IPA. It's very, very delicious and very hoppy. And I've got the pink boots as well. So we can just jump right into it. Right. We're going to duck out, but we will be here and, uh, I don't know, be in the peanut gallery, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. So, Rob, uh, I think the first Don. thing is to explain <laughs> what a paleo artist slash science illustrator is. All right. So, um, so paleo art is a subset of science illustration, science illustration being any Thing that uh, any piece of art that helps explain science. And this goes well beyond uh, just, you know, those boring figures that you saw in textbooks, although those are important. Um, they can be uh, animations, they can be comic books, they can, any kind of form of art um, that helps explain um, something that's a little bit, that needs some that would uh, do better if it wasn't just words, you know? Imagine yeah. um, and the last uh, article you read about space and if there wasn't a picture uh, to bring you in um, or a description of a yellow butterfly without a picture. You know, you'd be like, what kind of yellow? You feel like you're missing something. So science illustration helps um, describe 
uh, things that are impossible to photograph is usually uh, where where they call us in. Uh, things that are extinct is a very easy answer to give. You know, you can't take pictures of dinosaurs or mammoths, um, but anything, any view of the inside of the earth you've ever seen, um, any uh, illustration of um, a behavior, though that's sometimes very difficult to photograph. Um, so stuff like that and, yeah. uh, pretty, is where we come in. You're pretty limited with technical descriptions. So being able to draw or give some sort of visual context to these concepts is uh, pretty awesome. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so how does, we all do dinosaurs as kids and uh, our notebooks and stuff. How do you how do you take this, this thing that we all did as a child and turn it into a profession? Well, um, it's uh, it's all about being being a total nerd in front of the right <laughs> people. <laughs> um, you just um, I I've I've always loved dinosaurs, just like like you said. And for me, drawing them was the only proper way to really explore them. Um, and once that skill started to develop, um, uh, that you either meet someone, for me, I, I, I read about it, that there was a job such as, you know, science illustration, um, and that you can uh, apply this, this skill to drawing what you, what you love. Um, I think passion holds sway over the world. And if, you, uh, if you're a total nerd in front of someone that needs your work, uh, or has an appreciation for it, suddenly that becomes a job and it's not just a hobby. Um, but the hobby is definitely the right place to start because you, you definitely need to love it. And because um, you're going to be doing, you, know, you spend, I spend many, many hours um, researching and drawing over and over and over again so that you're, you're familiar with the forms. Um, but yeah, you kind of just, uh, you kind of just get them. Keep yeah, you, you do the work. I, I yeah, someone once told me you do the work and uh, the job will the career will come later. Yeah, um, yeah. you just I can see that in a lot of places where the passion is the driver, and then like as a result of the passion, you get you get something that someone else can't do. Like it's it's, it's physically impossible for them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> People keep telling me, uh, it's like, wow, you're so talented, you're so talented, you're so talented, and that's true. <laughs> But what, <laughs> what is also true is the work that goes into that, is the, is the, uh, the drive, the will to act, you know, training and all that is nothing compared to, to like, I, I don't want to do anything else but draw long dead things because I like, I like the, the science that goes into learning about them and yeah. I like what they – you know all the things that we can get into that later. I'll I'll go off on tangents before we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, just quick question: Do you have any art endeavors outside of your science illustration? Um, I do, I do. I'm going in on a. It's, it's relatively recent. I'm going in on a project with a friend. Um, uh, it's a, it's a uh, kind of like a picture book um about the wilderness and exploration and it's a there's a little bit of fantasy to it um but we're going to be we're doing a lot of um field sketching so like drawing from observation uh to help tell the story so a lot of times in picture books you get sort of like this omnipotent um view uh where it's like some camera somewhere unassociated with the with the characters showing you all these these aspects are instead this is drawn from the actual characters as they observe the, the world um, and sort of like Dinotopia um, and a few other picture books I could I have forgotten the names of. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah um, and I'm thinking about a, a, a kind of short story graphic novel surrounding some um, some extinct animals. Um, I would love to read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, the idea came to me from a, an old assignment. I love going back and because um, I'm, I'm a, I love worrying about old assignments that didn't quite go so well. So <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that anxiety can be fruitful. And uh, it's like I should go back and do this. And this particular assignment was do a comic book, but all the all the all the uh, the, the copy, all the text is um, lyrics from a song. 
And so there's this one I want to try to redo and set it to a, a certain Radiohead song. Um, and I think it could be pretty interesting. So, but I have to get Tom York to sign off on it first. So. <laughs> so going back to your, uh, your paleo artist, what was your favorite childhood dinosaur? And did that change as you learned more about dinosaurs? Oh boy. Um, well, it all, it all started with a, uh, a stegosaurus and I was able to, to get him out of hiding uh, so they could oh, make an appearance yeah. today. <laughs> oh, <that's> so cute. <laughs> this is like circa 1992 or three or something. Wow. Some embarrassing length of time. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so my dad gave it to me. It was the, one, of my, one of the first things that set me off on dinosaurs and it looked like an alien to me. And, um, and, was like, and he was like, no, this thing was real. It was right here, you know, on this planet, you know, millions and millions and millions of years ago. Um, and that kind of, that's what got me, that it wasn't a monster. Because monsters are cool. Monsters are still cool. Godzilla is the king. But the idea that some something that was so fantastical, but that was real, that came out of this planet, that... That got me. So Stegosaurus for a very long time, um, and I'm I'm happy to say it circled back around to one of my favorites. Um, but I went through a very very long raptor phase um, when I was a kid. That was definitely my favorite, um, <laughs> in in no small part to, due to a certain Spielberg production. <laughs> um, my my sisters probably are going to be in therapy for a very long time, uh, remembering when I would chase them around the house as a velociraptor. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> exactly. You're supposed to be afraid of me. <laughs> um, but uh, now, kind of uh, older, as a uh, from an artistic point of view, I really, really like ceratopsids. Uh, Triceratops, Styracosaurus. Um, there's nothing better than drawing like just a huge, uh, beautiful array of, of ornamentation on a head of that crest. And they're like built like very energetic rhinos. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're magnificent. Um, and another thing you don't see a lot of these days, all that weaponry. Um, same thing with like the tail end of the stegosaurus. So I, I think those are really, that's, that's really fun to draw. Um, yeah. Raptors are still fun to draw, although they they are they're mired in a lot of um, a lot of critic a lot of uh, debate right now. So uh, where you put your feathers, every single one, you have to read another paper before you place a feather. So they're, they're a little bit more stressful than enjoyable. Right now. <laughs> I was creeping through your Instagram and I saw quite a few raptor photos with feathers, and I was like, eh, or pictures rather, illustrations with feathers. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. We got a oh, yeah. feathers, approved feathers, paleo illustrator. Oh yeah, totally approved. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can say that birds are dinosaurs, full stop. Not birds are kind of like dinosaurs. Birds are related. No, birds are dinosaurs. Three words. Nice. Yeah, full stop. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever seen a picture of a bird without feathers, it looks like a dinosaur, just like like tiny. <laughs> yeah, totally <And> terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when I hear things like science illustration, I really think of like Lewis and Clark and back in a time where it was something done out of necessity because, you know, photographs weren't really a thing that mm. were easily accessible. But here in modern times, um, when everyone has these smartphones in their pocket and can take pictures of most things, how are paleo artists and science illustrators still so relevant these days? Well, that's that's the rub, isn't it? <laughs> um, and yeah, and uh, this isn't this isn't a, um, a modern problem. I mean, photography has been taking over the field of illustration in general, not just science illustration, since like this, uh, God, like the fifties or sixties, and it started to become mainstream in black and white. Um, but like I was mentioning earlier, there's still a lot of things that can't um, you can't photograph and. Uh, so I mean, I, me I mentioned that about how um, you yeah, know, yeah. pictures of pictures of space. Um, there, there's some. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you know, with with NASA, you have I, I guarantee you go onto their website. Any photograph, any well, 
image that you see, um, a lot of them that weren't anything that wasn't taken by the Hubble is a uh, is a science illustration. Um, uh, yeah. that, that red eye of Sauron that everyone with the, the black hole that wasn't an image that was an artist's rendering uh, the that that asteroid that came barreling through our solar system a couple years ago mm -hmm. NASA only had a couple points of data on a screen to, to to realize what that was and the the round like spaceship looking thing that we all saw was some some artistic rendering so there's still places I won't you know, go back into all the examples I listed yeah. earlier um, there's still ways that uh, that we can, you know, a need for um, that. But to to kind of com uh, address the, the the phone issue, um, if you have a you know a bird in front of you, you can take a picture. Um, but that bird is moving around a lot, right? And <laughs> yeah. you've only got you've only got one. And maybe if you're a really good photographer and you've got a big lens and a big budget, you can get a lot of pictures of a lot of birds like National Geographic does. But even Nat Geo that has some of the best photography, wildlife photography in the world, has, he still uses a ton of science illustrations um, because there are processes that that bird might go through, like um, like changing over time, um, that or or comparing it to other species. That's much better described with an illustration. There could be you want to um, look at sexual dimorphism, um, or like a, you know relating species, and you want them all in the same shot, and you can't. It's it may be hard, if not impossible, to get that with a photograph. But an yeah, illustrator can sit in the same photo. If that doesn't work, <laughs> no, no, yeah. But you know, even even photo, um, uh, even like montaging all of those photographs together, that still takes an artistic eye. Um, some people say, well, what about computer generated images? That's that's a science illustration. Um, there, there's, there's one in particular that I bet every single person watching tonight uh, has seen a lot of, um, and that is viruses. Uh, COVID-19, that, that red um, orb of hell that, uh, that you see every time you go online, that's a science illustration. Um, and, or at least... Mm -hmm. Or at least it's been, because um, I guarantee you, photographs of that size aren't going to come out uh, pleasing for for a web page. Um, mm -hmm. So it's at least been doctored, if not completely done digitally. Um, so you got the very, very small and the very, very big, the universe, uh, any kind of um, cosmic thing you want to show to people, um, things that happen on a global scale or things that happen on a micro scale, you still can't photograph that. And I don't think we ever will. Um, so yeah, you still need, and of course, things that are long dead. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm gonna say. Things yeah. that you don't have pictures of anymore. You can't take right. pictures of something that's been extinct. <laughs> and um, and I, I use my iPhone all the time. Uh, last thing I'll say about this, because I've thought a lot about the, because people are always asking me why. It was the very first, very first job I ever had. I was in house at I'm at uh, Institute of Marine and Environmental Technologies, drawing the insides of a fish. And I was on an elevator my first day back from the lunchroom, and someone was like, some, some, he, he didn't mean anything by it, I'm sure, but in my mind, he's my nemesis. And he was like, <laughs> why can't you just take pictures of that? <laughs> I was like, go look up, go look up some a, a photograph of intestines, and then compare that to an illustration. There's a reason why Gray's Anatomy. It, the longest textbook used in med medicine is illustrated because yeah. guts are yeah. messy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 exactly, guts are messy and uh, it's hard to tell what's going on in there. Um, so it's it's better to get someone like me in, in front of the corpse and draw it out piece by piece and then and color code it and separate yeah and highlight it and say, hey, this is this is this is that that thing that you know because you're a doctor i don't have to know that exactly yeah this is that thing you wanted me to draw the the abdul um squishy <laughs> squishy bits <laughs> the squishy bits yes <laughs> um so yeah you get you you, you still some st stuff you can totally photograph it but um i don't know if it translates so well <laughs> Um, so as a science illustrator, do you, do you guys ever get anything wrong? I'm sure you guys are like perfect, right? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. No, nothing, nothing wrong. <laughs> no, uh, especially paleo art. Um, if, 
if you're at all plugged into what's going on in, in the dinosaur realm, uh, you know that very recently a new paper was published on Spinosaurus aegypticus, a uh, big, you know, kind of a big theropod lived in, in uh, Africa back when Africa was, was swamps along the coast. A uh, big sail on its back. It might have, may have seen it in a certain Spielberg production. Um, <laughs> anyway, a paper was released on it that changed its tail and changes the, the it suggests an aquatic lifestyle. So all the paleo artists have to go back to the, the drawing board. So there's that aspect of it, that, that things are evolving constantly um, and that we have, to, we have to often redo things or get some stuff wrong. But... Um, you know, with with modern things, you know, if you do your homework, that happens less. Uh, but for paleo art specifically, uh, you you have to accept. Uh, you you almost hope that you'll be proven wrong because that means we've learned something new. Yeah. And uh, but but for me, and I'm going to get a little sentimental here. That that's the that opens the door to to the good stuff of paleo art and what what really makes it fascinating for me personally. Um, is that it transcends uh, a figure that you would see in an article or a paper or even on the cover of a textbook and becomes something um, just much more true to fine art. Uh, you have, I've got, a, I've got a poster above me right now. It's moved with me every single, every single time since I was uh, in high school um, by um, Rudolf Zallinger. And he did this big, big, beautiful, it's, it's very special to me. It comes from uh, the Yale Peabody Museum, one of the very first um, centers of paleontology in, in America. Um, and it depicts the stages of life. It's called uh, um, in the Mesozoic and a little bit before that. It starts in the, the, uh, the Devonian and goes all the way to the Cretaceous from, you know, you start very, very early on your right-hand side. And then as you read left, you go back and back in time. It's called the Age of Reptiles. And it's gorgeous. And there's a lot of, it's one example, it's one of my favorite examples of classic paleo art that is just done with that, you know, Renaissance master's touch. The problem is, it is laughably out of date. I think every single thing <laughs> in this, in this, uh, in this mural, and it's huge. He did it during in the 1940s during World War II, um, and uh, so it was a glum. It was a very grim time, um, and and the and the mood kind of reflects that. It's 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 painted very dark, um, and it, and and it's gorgeous, but it's out of date. And this happens. This happens a lot. You have all these really really wonderful pieces of paleo art that are now outdated and what do you do and a lot of museums unfortunately put it in the catacombs they put it in their archives where you don't where the public doesn't get to see um i've been back there a couple of times in several museums. exactly you know where they took the um where they took the ark of the covenant at the end of indiana jones uh, something like that they take all of um charles r knight's murals and, and statues and things and put it back there no but what the Yale Museum did, and I th I'm sure a couple of the other museums have followed suit, but this was the first example I saw, was instead of removing this mural, they put um, tablets, I iPads, in four or five different spots along the mural. And as you went down the line, down through time, you got to interact with the tablet and it would say, hey, uh, here's what we knew about Allosaurus at the time. Um, so this is why uh, Zallinger chose to draw it this way. Um, so since then, we've actually learned a lot about Allosaurus, believe it or not. Um, we've filled in the gaps differently with how we think about dinosaurs. And, and today, we would probably draw it like this. And it does honor to the science, but more importantly, it does honor to the art. Because paleo art, at the end of the day, doesn't just tell us about um, extinct animals. It tells it tells about us and how we grapple with the idea of extinction. Because in the 1800s, when we thought dinosaurs were uh, giants and demons, the idea of extinction uh, didn't exist. We couldn't comprehend it. And as it go through time, we start to we start to grapple with this idea of of how old the earth is and where we fit into the story of evolution. And we start filling in the gaps of our knowledge about dinosaurs with, with reptiles and now more bird-like things. Um, and when you look at 
a T-Rex or a Triceratops. Smithsonian had a wonderful example of this. They had a statue of Triceratops, four or five different ones all lined up together. And each one was completely different. And the, the little plaque, you know, explaining here, you know, it was dragging its tail because we thought dinosaurs were dumb and stupid and they, they <laughs> went extinct because they were too dumb to survive, you know, go figure. <laughs> and so it's dragging its tail. And then the next one is really shrink wrapped and skinny. And then the other one has a bit more meat on its bones. And then the next one, the skull is completely changed. Um, so it, it's always evolving. And I think paleo art stands alone in science illustration um, because it not only again, tells us about the subject, but tells a, tells a story of our uh, coming to terms with the history of, of the planet and, and our place there. Yeah, it's like a um, medium for a mirror where we're like drawing this thing, but in reality, we're, we're projecting a lot of ourselves into it. Exactly, exactly. Every dinosaur I draw is a, is a, is a reflection of myself and like that time I period. Some anthropomorphized uh, <laughs> dinosaur drawings on your Instagram. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Is that, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sure a shrink could uh, could could get some inter interesting uh, inferences out of some of those. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, man. So, what is a fun or funny time that you've been wrong? in your illustrations. Oof, oh, I need another drink for that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so in my, in my, I mean, I've been wrong a lot before when I when it was still a, uh, a hobby, but in a, as a professional, in my professional career, um, let's see, well, this happened very recently. Um, I got a butterfly wrong. Um, there's uh, there are two butterfly that look very very similar. This is for a, a commission um, for a place in Utah actually, and the two butterfly kind of look the same: the viceroy and the monarch butterfly, and they are separated. Uh, you can tell them apart by one lateral stripe on the very uh, on the lower wings, and there are three butterfly in that image. Two of them are monarchs, and one of them somehow was a viceroy. And this Ill image I submitted for class. It was on my website for m almost a year. Uh, it's been looked at for, it's, this isn't a new image. And um, it was only uh, um, somewhat recently corrected. And so I was, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny because it's, it, it, it went unseen all this time and we're trying to send it to the printers now and now we catch it and I'm like, well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad we caught it. I don't want to be known to, to everyone in Utah as the guy that, that doesn't know. <laughs> he really what, doesn't know butterflies. No, he doesn't know butterflies clearly. <laughs> um, but that it went in front of, front of all of the, all of my peers and professors and every, none of them caught it. So that made me feel a little bit, but it, it's kind of silly because it, it literally took five minutes to correct, but it's, it's ex but when you're identifying a species, sometimes it's that important. Um, and uh, I don't know, I drew it during midterms. So uh, <laughs> I, I was super, I, I it was really <laughs> stressful. I, exactly, I don't know. <laughs> I think I switched, switched the illustrations. It was supposed to go for a, a final one. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but uh, so that, that's kind of silly and you make mistakes and you have to be, uh, there's another mistake we made. Um, identifying a crane. Um, this one, the uh, Stokes um, bur, uh, bur guide to bird, field guide, um, mm -hmm. was wrong. And, and it wasn't wrong on purpose or lack of trying. It's that there was a recent genetics test that reclassified the genus and the species for this crane. Um, so the scientific name, the binomial, um, had completely changed. And we didn't catch it until we sent it for review. Um, and I, I went into my book all frustrated because I take binomials very seriously. And I was like, no, look, it says it right here. Uh, but you, you know. I know your book's wrong, man. <laughs> if you, I know, I, 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 clearly books are very important to me. If you can't trust books, what can you trust? I don't know. <laughs> Someone wrote that down on paper. <laughs> it's gotta be true. There it is in black and white. It can't be wrong. <laughs> uh, but, Dude, it's not, you know, so not just paleontology, but science, even even birds that are alive today, right now, they are, 
what we know about them, or at least how we classify them. That's, a, you know, and scientists are, they're a little crazy when it comes to classifying things. Uh, I, I don't want to get into it here because there may be small children present, but um, <laughs> they get a little crazy like that. So uh, anyway, so so we were wrong all the time. Um, and you take it, he's like, well, I'm going to double check my binomials now. And it's like, I'm going to make sure all my references is, is absolutely correct before I submit anything. And it, it makes you a better artist. Uh, it makes you a better researcher. I love research. Um, and my favorite part of the day is when I get that species list. And it's like, okay, here's all the animals we want you to illustrate. And I was like, oh, yes. Uh, and I go, to the, you know, I go to the library. I can't do that anymore. So you, you go to the website. Anyway, um, it's, fun to, it's fun to look up things yeah. about the animals you're going to draw. The more you understand it, the more, the better you'll be able to draw it, hopefully. Yeah, I think that's a good perspective to go into it with, to say, you know, I'm probably going to be wrong once or twice mm -hmm. or a hundred times, but, you know, that's just part of this process. We're all developing. It's not like anyone else could have gotten it right with the information that I had. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> but uh, um, being wrong as an artist only means you have to the, have stronger friends than the scientists. So the people that always catch me are, are the biologists or the paleontologists that I'm working with. And they're, because they, re I mean, I got a degree for, for drawing what they know, but they got a degree for knowing, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the stuff about this. <laughs> um, and so you, in order to make sure or err on the side of, of getting stuff right, um, you have to foster really good connections with the scientists uh, and the paleontologists. And, and they're, they're huge nerds just like you. And... Um, <laughs> you kind of get to them on that level and, and geek out about the, uh, about how the crest attaches to the back of the skull or how, where exactly the orbital will sit and, or, or how, or the proportions of the tail and, and reference to, to where something is standing. You know, you go off on these huge conversations about lineage and cladistics and evolution that normal people may, you know, may not have. And that all informs your art. Um, and so, yeah, you, you say, I'm going to be wrong, but um, I'm working. I'm not just me doing this. I'm working with a team of illustrators, and I've made some incredibly, incredibly good friends uh, doing this, and they've all corrected me, and I, I owe them very, a, a great deal because of that. <laughs> it's like uh, the correct information may have never been discovered if it weren't for the fact that the bad drawing was made off of the information that was available at the time. Totally, totally. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I mean, going back to paleo art, yeah, the, the information you have at the time can only get you so far. During the 90s, we had this huge, um, this huge uh, movement that made dinosaurs more active, but it also saw the rise of shrink wrapping so it's, it's kind of just where you've seen them, where the dinosaurs uh, and look emaciated. They look like they haven't eaten in months. Um, and that's because that's all we knew. We had the bones, and maybe we knew where the muscles would go, but the soft tissue, the stuff that doesn't preserve, uh, we didn't know that. And so, so they were, the researchers, the scientists, were, were naturally a little hesitant to show this. Um, and you'll still find that in some, some small parts of, of, uh, of paleontology where the researchers are afraid to speculate. Um, and and this, this, is, this is where it gets tricky because you don't wanna, you don't wanna be too crazy with your reconstruction. Um, but if you stick to just the data that you have, you're gonna end up with, with shrink-wrapped, emaciated um, things that look like they could not have existed. They don't quite look real. Um, no. And that, that's the goal. You want it to be, people expect, you know, okay, this is a dinosaur. I, I, I guess it was real. Um, it still looks like a monster, so it doesn't really resonate with me. But to cross that border and, and to make it look like a real living, breathing animal, like a certain Spielberg production did, uh, you have to take some leaps. You have to speculate wildly where the, where the true data falls short. So, um, you know, the bones, what the paleontologists are telling you gets you so far. And then you as the artist has to say, based on what the bones are telling me and what I know of living animals, 
maybe maybe a waddle makes sense on this velociraptor. Maybe yeah. maybe these scoots on the foot make sense. Those little those little uh, scales you see on the foot of chickens. Maybe that makes sense in this animal. Maybe maybe it doesn't. Um, but if you don't take that leap, that creative leap, um, you won't get close to being being accurate or or or, or lifelike. You can yeah. never be a hundred percent accurate, but you can be. Um, you can be plausible. You can be. You can be pretty close. You can be, you know, approximate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, that's that's all we can hope for is to be well. You you were right for what we knew at twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that's that's what the best we can all strive to be is like best off of the information available at the time. Exactly. Sorry, exactly. I predict the future, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. When we were talking earlier in the week, you talked about how uh, you have to get all these armchair degrees to kind of do your job. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite armchair degree that you're required to get to do an illustration? Oh, boy. Well, um, <laughs> let's see. You know what? I really, really have enjoyed um, paleopathology. Paleopathology. Okay. So, yeah. So pathology <laughs> being, yeah, the things that are wrong with your bones, uh, ailments or, or damages or the ways that the bone has healed itself uh, because bone is bone. Uh, whether you are a, um, you know, multi-ton uh, long neck sauropod dinosaur or a, you know, a six foot naked um bipedal mammal, your bones act the same. So all the information that we know about how our bones break apply to old bones. Um, and so there's this whole field of study. And I, I made a very good friend uh, who studies this specifically in hadrosaurs and duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, and he looks at how the bones break and how um, dentition, how, how, how teeth from other dinosaurs are, are affecting the bone or how something, uh, a stress fracture um, can tell you about how an animal is using its, its, um, its limbs to hunt or to, or to bring down prey or to, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's a window into behavior and I, I'm, I'm a sucker for behavior. That is probably my favorite thing to illustrate uh, and probably the thing I've illustrated the most when it comes to, uh, to professional paleo art. Um, and almost all of those are based on bones. Um, there are marks on the, on the crest of a triceratops that when you line up another triceratops with it, they line up perfectly. And so, um, Dr. Andy Farkey was able to to uh, to surmise and glean from the evidence that these guys these guys were fighting and they were doing it they were doing it like this this is how they were doing it and he'd get some toys and they'd play and he'd be like oh my gosh so, that, so you know that, that like that's what I was doing when I was five it's like that was correct um, and you can tell that from the <laughs> yeah validation is yes, exactly. Um, there, there are, like I was saying, stress fractures in the arm uh, or, or the foot of Allosaurus tells us how it was using those limbs. Um, some really gruesome ones, which made its way into the Smithsonian's new dinosaur hall, um, show teeth mark of a Tyrannosaurus rex on the back crest of, um, of a Triceratops suggest that it was pulling the head off of the body so that it could nibble at the nice tasty bits behind the skull because that's oh, where the big the yeah that's where all the big fat neck tissue was attaching so that's where all the good stuff was but you had to get this stupid crest out of the way and and so um they it think that it would be attached to the head so exactly the head. <laughs> well you know luckily for t-rex it has this giant head and 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 the and no arms to get in the way you know it'd be a shame if its arms were getting in the way when it did this <laughs> um, but yeah, paleopathology can tell us a lot about how things were healing. Um, um, if something has healed uh, after it's been attacked, and say, okay, so may it, 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 this was a failed predation attempt. Maybe, maybe T. Rex always hunted like this, uh, or maybe this was just the one time in a million that this animal tried it. Probably not. It probably hunted like this. Um, so it, it can tell us a lot, and and it can tell us about what what. Um, 
what animals were eating what, where they fit in the food chain, the, the trophic system. Um, we found very recently, one of my favorites, um, a, a perfectly preserved squid in the Jurassic, and, and squid being invertebrates, soft body, they don't fossilize very well. Yeah, uh, so, good. no. <laughs> Finding this was, was cool all on its own. It would have been a, been a landmark specimen, but it had a tooth embedded in it. Wow. And we knew where this tooth came from because we'd found it before, Rampharynchus. And so we could tell, hey, at least once a Rampharynchus tried skimming its tooth. We knew exactly where the tooth fit in the jaw. Uh, we can say, hey, this is where that, that we think that maybe Rampharynchus was eating shrimp and maybe it was eating like, uh, or squid, sorry. Maybe it was eating it like this. The squid got away, so it didn't work, but it happened at least once. So <laughs> that, 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 that painting is correct. Uh, and it probably happened again because animal, I mean, it's, it's very rare. Think about the, 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 the selective bias of the, of the fossil record. Um, yeah, yeah. For something to just happen once and we get that one time, that one off in the fossil record, um, the odds are not, are not in your favor and that. So it probably happened a bunch. Um, and this squid just got away, but so, so yeah, th pathologies can tell us a lot about behavior. And so I think that's when you can, when you can gleam, um, something as complex as what an animal, how an animal is behaving that lived millions and millions of years ago from rock and mineral, uh, out of the, out of the, the, the dirt. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> I mean, Brenda was a physical anthropologist. She was quite the, quite the individual to dig into some skeletons. Yeah. Oh, okay, right on. You know exactly what I'm talking I about. Know, I know, I do. This has been like so interesting. I've, I've loved everything that you said, especially about the behavior. Cause like you said, like to be able to have those instances is, is just really remarkable. And so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so to pivot a little bit from fun things to draw, what is the least favorite thing you've ever drawn or that you were required to draw, I would say? Mm. Mm. Um, man. So many bad things to draw. I've drawn so many bad things. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, I've drawn a couple bad mammals. Uh, they're tough. Um, you know what I still don't like, and I've never liked, are, are bushy plants. So what I do tell you is that, man. It's a lot of, it's hard to capture that, you know, you never really know, don't understand plants until you have to draw them. Because you're looking at a tree, and it's very pleasant. It's got all those leaves, and the limbs disappear, and you're like, I, this is a nice tree. I like this tree. I'm, I, you know what, I'm going to draw this tree. And halfway through it, you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> because you have to, you have to uh, uh, capture that, that mass, and you have to try to, 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 to figure out where the shapes are, but the shapes are going all over the place. And it always ends up a mess, and I feel like if I can draw a really, really, really nice elm tree or, or something like that, uh, I, I'll, I'll be, I will have leveled up. Um, but it, 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 any, <laughs> any scale. Give me a tree. That's a tree. Yeah, thing. give me a tree. Oh, my gosh. Every time someone wants some foliage, I'm like, no. Don't, can't they be like in a dirt parking lot or something? Like, do they have to be in their environment? No. Um, that's why I like yucca and and pine trees and things that are are, are stiff and 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 sparse, yeah. and, uh, and, and 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 you know bushy things get get kind of troublesome. Um, and and it's all about your mark making. Um, you learn as an artist the more th uh, that you draw that your the way that you hold your pencil and the way that you draw your line. Um, has a lot to do with how you interpret uh, what you do. You don't use the same. You don't use the same word for every everything you want to describe. It's just like language, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, it, or, or, or tools. You know, if if your only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, then you'll treat every problem like a nail and 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 go after it in a and in, in maybe not the right way. So you have to be able to to um, to vary your, your your gesture and your mark and your hatching and uh, not everything is is like I started off just like pounding the crayon into the paper and, and scratching out this this hard line that, that that often will not yield good results especially when coming to bushy trees so uh, I'm happy living out here in the desert there aren't a whole lot of bushy trees um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, that's that's probably my least favorite thing to draw. And a second only to horse legs. A horse legs. Uh, Interesting. Horse legs. Like I feel yeah. like little stick, I I would draw them as just like little awkward stick figures at the bottom of a horse. <laughs> <laughs> as they should be, and I, and I try to do that, but um, the way that the horse is standing is uh, is counterintuitive. But um, even if you understand what's going on. Um, it can still be really hard to draw. I don't want to. I don't want to get too too much into that. But uh, yeah, horse legs are, are stupid. That's why. That's why every all, all the little um, uh, amateur artists that are trying to make their way in, in Instagram, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of horses because they know that's that's next to like the human hand. That's one of the hardest things to draw. So they they start with that first. It's like, look, I drew a good horse. I'm a good artist. Hard to hire me. Um, Interesting. Jumping right into the deep end. I'm not. On, I'm not about that. <laughs> I didn't see you breaking your Instagram. No. <laughs> uh, I drew an ex I drew an extinct horse foot, uh, which was which was enough for me. <laughs> didn't. Did, <laughs> so on the on the other other side of that, um, what is an illustration that you're most proud of, and why? Mm. Well. Um, I think I, I have, I have maybe, they come neck and neck. I have maybe two answers for that. Okay. Uh, probably the, the, the truest answer is going to be, a uh, this, something I did for class, uh, when I was at CSUMB, uh, California State University in Monterey Bay, where I got my, um, degree in, so my graduate degree in science illustration. Um, and it's an acrylic painting of a, of a stegosaurus. Um, and I got high praise from a, from one of my professors who is extremely hard to please, <laughs> uh, and she she liked the, the the sense of light and it made it into our graduate show. Um, and it's the biggest thing I've ever done in um, in uh, a traditional media, so so by hand and not on the computer. Um, okay. When I look at it, it's like okay, I I did that pretty good. It looks like you know I, I had drawn this is again my first favorite animal. Yeah. Uh, dinosaurs, stegosaurus. So, so I've drawn it all, many times. So here was my opportunity to do it, do it true justice. Um, and I, I did okay. And now when I look at it, I want to just do it again. Um, <laughs> even though I'm very proud of it and everyone who sees it seems to like it. Um, I still want to redo it. And that's just, that's just the artist's plight. Sometimes you, I, I feel like no matter how happy I or successful something is, I will always want to redo certain things, um, especially when you're so intimately involved in it. Like you are, like you, you, you literally drew every single detail on it, so you have an understanding of that work that other people just can't perceive. Precisely, yes, that's that's the nature of all art, because um, you you spend, God, upwards of fifty hours with something um, that that is a whole block of your life um, that you left in the pigment um, and looking at it doesn't just remind you know it doesn't just bring to mind you know what the process but that time that you were working on and what you were feeling at the time because you put all of that into your colors into your pose into how bulky you make the form uh, into what you have going on in this particular one you know stegosaurus uh, the only time the media finds it appropriate to show that animal is when it is fighting for its life against uh, meat-eating animal dinosaurs. Uh, so I chose uh, to show it having survived one of these fights with just a couple scrapes, um, which which are hard to see. You have to really look to see that detail. Um, so it's it survived something catastrophic and then come out alive on the other end, which which may or may not be telling to my mindset at the time during <laughs> during grad school. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm pretty proud of that one. Yeah. Uh, did you have a presentation of some of your work that you wanted to share with us? Yes, I did. Would you like to see it? Yeah, let's end with that. I think that'd be wonderful. Okay. Let me see if I can get the, the screen share to, to behave. You'll have to let me know if it's failing. Okay. Let's see. All right, it is prompting me with things. All right. 
let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. I've talked a lot about Instagram, but yeah. And your website. And your website. Your website's gorgeous. I know, I love it. That's that soothing like homepage of you drawing. Like Oh yeah, you like that? I, dude, I had to film that so many times and that's just on like my old phone and uh, I had to build this whole great. little uh thanks. Yeah, I had it was it was tough. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we're having something come through here in a second. Maybe. Oh, oh, we may have lost Rob. Oh, he's oh no, back. he's back. <laughs> <laughs> he also has a website. This could be a good time to just pause that. It's just rob-soto.com. Yeah. And it's in the live comments, the link as well. I think so. it Rob froze. Yeah, Rob. we may have lost Rob there. For we may have lost Rob. Hopefully he comes back here in a second. Um, but I can feel his pain with his stupid horse legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's the worst. laughs> uh, actually, the bane of my existence was uh, antlers of a ice age uh, mule. Oh yeah. yeah. No, not a mule. That's a horse, and it was no it was mule. It was like a mule, mule deer with an elk. Elk. Oh, okay. It like, had like these ridiculous antlers. Like that was a pain. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. I was not happy with that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think we may have lost Rob. Hopefully, it wasn't on our end, um, so we don't have to take the blame. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, we put we put the link to his website uh, in the comments on both Facebook and mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, also, you can find his Instagram through there. I'm gonna, uh, I assume and look to make sure his Instagram handles out there too. Um, so you can see all the beautiful work that he's been talking about. Uh, we mm -hmm. do want to uh, make a couple announcements. Um, first off, uh, some friends of ours, Alliance House and Mental Healthy Utah is doing a trivia night this Friday. And so if you're looking for something to do this Friday, because they couldn't do their labeled fest that they do every year, uh, they, they're going virtual. Um, and so just follow us on social media and we will share those events, mm -hmm. that event with you and other things that they're doing. Uh, important, important organization doing important things. Mm -hmm. Labeled Film Fest is an awesome film fest. It's really a great shame that it's not happening this year. So this is the next best thing. Trivia yeah. night. <laughs> yeah, that it wouldn't just be um, it wouldn't just be um, trivia that they're going to intersperse it with some short, uh, informative, and interesting um, films and things like that. So it should be pretty cool. Um, hmm. So with that also, as I mentioned before, we're going to take a little bit of a break here uh, with our virtual science happy hour uh, because we're, we're moving on to do, we're going to grow and do some cool stuff. Uh, we've been talking to Ketos about partnering with them, uh, and we are going to start doing, a, doing this there. It will still be live streamed, uh, but we will be sitting across the bar from the scientist. Um, oh, nice. it, across the bar from the scientist um, and uh, where you can either come in and sit with us or uh, you can still watch it um, recorded or live from the comfort of your own home. Now, of course, this is going to be completely based off of, um, you know, the variations of stay at home orders and things. So maybe June, maybe July, we'll see, but it's going to happen and it'll be awesome. Uh, and we got Rob back, so let's bring him back so we can look at his work. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, sorry. My oh, from the netherworld of the internet. Uh, my computer did not like sharing screens. Uh, so. <laughs> At the risk of, do of doing that again, um, I'm going to take one of these pieces off the wall. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Well, we can put them on a big, we can make them big, right? Yeah, we can. Uh, don't, don't make my, my ego too big now. <laughs> I think we're going to take us out and we'll just make. Okay. 
So, so this is one of the more popular pieces uh, that I've done recently of uh, Dimetrodon. Um, so this is a good example of uh, what paleo art or what science illustration uh, does all the time and called spot illustrations. Let's see if we can get some better light on this thing. I'm not gonna mess with it too much. Uh, so yeah, spot illustrations. It's when you're just focusing on just the animal. Um, and it doesn't have to be just extinct species. Uh, this can be living animals. We do a lot of spot illustrations where you're just focusing on the animal. That, that's, that's hard to do with a camera. You've got all that stuff in the background. Um, so that's, that's another thing you can't, you need, you need us for. Don't just take pictures of things. Draw them. You never oh, understand okay. something until you draw it. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so with those color with those colors on there, um, I'm guessing this is one of your artistic decisions. It kind of like reminded me of an iguana or something. Yeah, yeah. So the colors came directly from a living animal. Um, sometimes we do that uh, for the presentation. I was going to show uh, one of you know decision making for for a Velociraptor I did, which is on my website. I urge you guys to go and check it out. Velociraptor mongoliensis, um, and we decided to 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 use colors based on a coyote because the coyote fits in a similar niche. It, um, it's placed the food chain as Velociraptor. It lived in a similar environment and it's, you know, it's almost the same size. So why not give it the same color? Uh, so sometimes you'll be able to, to reason your way to, a, to suitable colors. And other times you, you have to take liberties, like I was saying earlier, and just uh, spec, speculate wildly. So this, this is a bit more speculative, but it's a it's a bright color, you know. It has that huge display, uh, so it, that's that's got to be used for um, for talking to other members of the species, saying, "Hey, I'm really I'm really strong, and you don't want to mess with me. Uh, you don't want to eat me either." Members of other species, um, and you might you might want to mate with me. Look how look how much uh, <laughs> energy I've been able to put into my into these colors into the sale. It looks pretty healthy. I, I'm I'm probably a good choice for a mate. Uh, saying all of those things, so bright colors make sense with that with that animal in in my mind. Or it was most things are are sort of brown, so <laughs> no, how it ends up. <laughs> that's how it ends up, sadly. But you know, there there, there are there are those brightly colored exceptions, and, and and birds are very very bright colored, and their eyes are exceptional. There are a lot of I have I have references to back that up. Birds' eyes are phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> Um, and that's why they are so brightly colored. So, so uh, some of the some dinosaurs were probably brightly colored too. So, on the on the topic of colors in dinosaurs, I had read I think it was last year. I didn't read the paper, but I read a summary of the paper. Who was talking about how they were able to look at the chemical composition or something about the fossils and infer the colors of the feathers based yes. off how they physically appeared? Do you want to talk about that at all? Absolutely. Oh my God. Um, I wish I, I wish I wasn't slightly tipsy so I could remember all the all the, the, the exact specimens you're referring to. But yes, uh, we were able to look at the um, basically the structures that determine color. Um, color being one of those things we thought we'd never know about. It's like, well, we can we we probably figure out how how strong T. Rex could bite, and that's what really matters. But we'll probably never be able to know what color he is. Um, and now we are finding. Uh, evidence of, of color structures, and it's coming from feather impressions. The two things we know for sure what color they were um, are feathered, small, uh, bipedal dinosaurs, theropods. Um, one of them is Microraptor, who is, is in the studio with me tonight. <laughs> um, he's a four-winged... Um, yeah, so it's got wings on 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 the back here, wow. as well as this and this little tail, which is scientifically accurate because we have the, the impression of what the tail looked like. So that's kind of cool. Um, but we know it was black, and not just black, but iridescent black because of the way those the structures the, uh, that that determine the, um, what color again. Uh, like a crow or a raven. Exactly. Exactly. So, so crows and ravens, that, that's something um, that, ha that existed already, that, that color choice. Um, so you can, and the, you sometimes feel, feel qualified enough to, to plug in bird, uh, missing dinosaur data with bird data. Um, but 
not exclusively, uh, because wings, of course, were not evolved for flight first. It was, you know, warmth and uh, and display, and then, hey, uh, you know what? I figured out what I can do with this this really cool. Um, you look know, at this cool trick. <laughs> look at this cool trick. I can jump from tree to tree. Hey, maybe develop that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Someone should get on. And then <laughs> Someone should get on that, but not me. Um, so yeah, um, we yeah, so we're we're getting closer to figuring out color. Um, but a lot of but for those that we don't have direct fossil evidence for those for that color, um, we we rely on educators. And it's good to have a paleontologist around when you're doing that. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. the, the presentation didn't work out. Oh, no, that's fine. It's, it's, it's been absolutely wonderful <laughs> chatting with you. Everyone yeah, has to go to your website. <laughs> yes, now everyone, you, you have no choice. It was going to be easy for you. Now now you have to work for it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get more traffic to your website. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> it's been an amazing yeah. conversation to listen to. I'm, I'm so excited to learn more about this. Um, yeah, right on. Yeah, we've just been kicking back, drinking more ketos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the conversation. It's been great. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you so so for letting me letting me talk at length about one of my you know my favorite things. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for taking out your you know busy schedule and <laughs> using your expertise. Uh, yeah. Um, I've, I've truly enjoyed this past hour just chatting with you. This has been wonderful. Dude, those are some killer questions too, man. Like for <laughs> real. Thank you for for stimulating my my brain at such a such a late hour of the day. <laughs> uh, when you make it up here, uh, we definitely owe you a drink. That's for sure. Uh, right on. Yeah, count on it. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, we're we're at the point where it's last call for all of us. Uh, okay. Well, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Or, well, <laughs> here. You're stuck in your house. You have to watch something else on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> videos, whatever. You've probably um, already wandered over to Netflix. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah, thank you so much, Rob Soto. And thank you, Brown, for, for being the uh, interviewers. Um, Our pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, All right, cheers. cheers. Thank you, guys. It was a blast. Cheers. <laughs> All right, we'll talk with you later. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Later, man. Bye.